Okay, so I'm going to try to give a shout out here to this book called Incomplete Nature. It's by Terence Deacon, and it's subtitled How Mind Emerged from Matter. And I can't say enough good things about that book. It's uh, it's, it's a pretty fat tome here. And even look at the book here. It's, it's pretty pretty good size. And uh, so it was a very difficult book, but there, there's so much that's going on in there that I guess relates to so many of the things I've talked about on my channel. And if you've read the book and you want to do a dialogue, get in touch with me. I'm happy to do it. Or if you just want to post a response to this, I'm more than happy to see if I could start either a reading group or some kind of engagement with it. There's no possible way I'm going to be able to talk about all that's going on in that book. And some of it is very difficult. You know, he's trying to give a kind of comprehensive theory of how how a theory of causality and information and work could be created that spans physics, chemistry, biology, and I guess all the way up into what we mean by information in the computer science realm, right? It's a, it's a very impressive uh, piece of work. And r rather than, I guess, try to tackle all of it, which would just be impossible. I mean, I don't even know how anyone would explain th this work, but let me see if I can try to introduce some of the key concepts and engage some of them and see if I can't get some response from people here. Okay, so I think one of the things to say is that he's trying to deal with the problem of, of life and of life's emergence out of physical process and how it seems to be a kind of violation, now not, or at least a momentary setback to the second law of thermodynamics. That is, there does seem to be a kind of radical non-equilibrium that's being achieved by living systems. That life steves off entropy in various ways, whether that's just in the homeostasis you know, the sort of homeostatic ways in which one's able to regulate one's body, to heal oneself, uh, to grow and develop, but also, I guess, in the sense in which cultural forms are able to perpetuate themselves and they don't just dissipate in transmission, but they convey a set of constraints that allow the perpetuation of further constraints that, I guess, make life in its varied forms possible. See, p part of the issue that he's going to begin with is what he calls um, intentional phenomena, or also, which are dealing with abstential phenomena. That is, phenomena where part of what you'd want to do is define it by what's being excluded or constrained out. But that's what compositional analysis would never reveal. That is, you'd never be able to go down and look at the component parts and in a reductive way, like in the way that you look at a machine, try to take the parts, show how they relate, and then explain what the machine is. Because in a biological system, so much of the order and the regularity, whether it has to do with m membranes related to metabolism or respiration, or I guess filtering forms even of cognition, right? There, there seems to be constraints in information which exclude and things partly are what they are by what's been excluded rather than simply defining them in terms of what they're composed of or you know what, what their composition is. Okay, so that, that's part of the backdrop. Now, what he does that's so amazing, again, he does so many things that are just amazing, he's sort of single-handedly introducing concepts and terms that are, they're rewriting, you know, physics, the way that people think about entropy in particular, that entropy has been a highly contested concept, especially as, as you move from like Boltzmann entropy, which largely refers to the movement of Molecules within fluids, we'll talk about gas molecules of different temperature, will achieve a kind of equilibrium that is an equal distribution of those temperatures where they'll achieve a kind of symmetry that as long as that is partialed off and it, it still can do work, right? I mean, we're able to do work if we're able to separate off differential 
um, temperatures, but the more that they get distributed out in an entropic way, they achieve an equilibrium which reduces the capacity to do work, right? And w I think we want to suggest that entropy characterizes all systems, and it does. There's no escaping the second law of thermodynamics, and yet living systems do seem to stab off and momentarily create conditions whereby they, again, they're not they're not subject, right, to the second law in the same level or order or magnitude. That is, they're able to harness some of the, the, the ways that things spontaneously move, spontaneously change, and they're able to take advantage of those. And so, okay, so here's the, the first real critical concept in the book. It's that you want to differentiate between orthograde change and contragrade change. Now, orthograde change is roughly what we mean by entropy. Now, it, it doesn't exactly mean that because it depends upon whether we're talking about the uh, thermodynamic level or the morphodynamic level or the teleodynamic level, which he's going to try to give this level to count. And it is, it's a book about multi-leveledness multi and the, the degree to which we have to account for the different dynamics that come into play and it, it's not an abandoning of the prior levels but it it harnesses and uses the properties and dynamics of the prior levels and then it, it adds new kinds of constraints that enable new kinds of work okay so we want to get at this difference between orthograde and contragrade in the thermodynamic system okay the orthograde is the spontaneous tendency to move towards something like an equilibrium. It's what we mean roughly by entropy. But there are other ways in which we can talk about contragrade um, processes at, the, at that thermodynamic level, and that would be where external work is done upon a system. So one you could imagine uh, just for example, you know, take a sugar cube, and this is one that he uses in the book, right? If you take a sugar cube and you drop it into water, it will, in time, slowly dissolve. And once it's dis and that's an orthograde process, it will slowly dissolve. And as it dissolves in there, it achieves a kind of symmetry or equilibrium whereby the concentration gets diminished as it gets spread out uh, throughout the water. Now. If you would try to get that sugar back by a contragrade process, m mechanical work employed to get it, it would be a great expenditure of energy, time, labor, work in order to get that, right? Again, if you try to think of the difference between contragrade of trying to extract the sugar now that it's just naturally dissolved itself in the water. And yet, if you just let the water evaporate, a good amount of that sugar will still be retained in the in the glass. And so that's an orthograde process as well. And so you want to see that there are different kinds of spontaneous orthograde processes that are going on and contragrade process emerges out from the intersection of adjacent levels of orthograde process. And so what he's going to try to do then, once he lays out this difference in thinking about entropy. Rather than thinking about entropy just simply in terms of the tendency of a system to move toward an increasing state of disorder or a diminishing capacity to do work, instead of that you say, okay, look, there's why do some things change, why do some things stay the same, and what is the difference between spontaneous change and non-spontaneous change, and can't we recognize different kinds of orthograde processes versus contragrade processes? And it has to do with the exertion of work. If you feel like work is happening to be exerted on it, that's some problem. It's very likely to be a contragrade process. If it feels like it's sort of happening on its own, well, then it seems like it's something like an orthograde process. Now, that distinction, what's so interesting is that once you lay out that distinction, you can start to see that as you move from thermodynamic process, which is strictly, I guess, a kind of causality, pure and simple, we'll call it you know, efficient causality, a material causality, 
that seems very different than the morphodynamics that come in at the next layer up. Now, morphodynamics have to do with geometric tumbling and the problems or the, the possibilities that come into play from various it's geometric unfoldings and probability states that come from, I guess, the way that certain forms and shapes are able to intersect and interact with neighboring shapes. And it's at the molecular level, right? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to think about I guess some of the, the issues of, of morphodynamics. M morphodynamics are, are very difficult to deal with because they're, they're somewhat rare in the physical world, but they do emerge as soon as you start to deal with life. That is, life starts to have properties whereby the form of something, it's like it becomes a kind of a type where it's more than simply causality, but it's a kind of causality that includes constraints where the constraints can perpetuate themselves and that's part of what we mean by information. That is, causality is not simply information because, I'm sorry, information is more than causality because information includes a kind of historical record of the constraints that were issued in that causality and then the possibility to re-perpetuate and continue those forms of constraints. Yeah, that you know, when I was younger, when I was a younger person, I, I used to teach, and I, I probably still would teach in some ways, that constraint is what makes information possible. If you want to know how is information possible, how is communication possible, you say, well, it has to do with constraints, and it has to do with exclusion, because there's just too many possibilities otherwise. And you, you, have, you have to... I guess lock the system down in some way by excluding things and the constraints make the information possible. But I think what Deacon is saying is something much more radical. He's saying that, and it it's, comes from Stuart Kaufman's work, it's also Robert Yelanowicz does a lot with this as well. I know Bob Logan has talked with me about this. But it has to do with the, the constraints are the information. Yeah, when, when you start to see that information and constraints are synonymous terms, you're starting to go in the right direction. Now, Deacon does not deal with this at all in the book, but there's a dissertation waiting someone who could tackle Deacon's book and then read it and jump into Anthony Wilden's work and Kenneth Burke's work. So he doesn't talk about any of this at all, but the word no, I mean, the word no is like an exemplar of information that is the constraint, and it's a constraining information that allows the perpetuation of itself. You know, there's there's moral order that a person has imposed upon them through the don't, and the don't becomes a self-regulating uh, information, sort of a, a capacity to do work for, uh, mentally. This idea of don't sort of does work in, in the world. Okay, I'm, I'm back all over. i, I got to go back. So if you want to get to what we mean by morphodynamics, right, or what what Deacon's again? I'm the book is very difficult. I'm I'm thumbnail tr trying to thumbnail sketch here. Just an infinity of things going on in this book. But what he means by morphodynamics, you might think about it in terms of resonance frequencies. In that some things seem to have certain resonance frequencies where it's not the amount of energy per se, that performs the work. It has to do with a certain form, and it's in the construction of musical instruments. It, it does have to do with things like resonance frequencies, but it, it also it starts to get into things like shapes of wings, and it starts to get into, into types and the reality of types. I guess one way to say it is that Deacon is giving a radical critique of nominalism and he's giving a realist argument for the reality of types and types being necessary to evolutionary process. Again, it's probably very abstract, but th think of it this way, that one's body is partly defined, partly defined by what has been constrained out of it. And... <sighs> the maximum temperature that your body could withstand or the 
the lowest temperature that it could withstand, those are part of the parameters of your body, even though your body may never encounter those parameters. They're somehow, the absent phenomena are included in, but by definition, excluded, right? They're, they're recognized as needed to be excluded, and they're, in that sense, they're a kind of abstential um, organization. Now, I guess the interesting process is when you move from thermodynamic to morphodynamic. And okay, you know, you might think of morphodynamic, I guess, partly in terms of, let's get at snowflakes. You know, I mean, snowflakes all have this hexagonal shape, and yet each snowflake is unique because the snowflake is, it's an indexical record of the environmental conditions under which it was melting and then refreezing and the different atmospheric pressures, the different wind conditions, the different kinds of geometric tumbling that was occurring at the molecular level, that is, certain molecules had picked up various kinds of particulate matter in the atmosphere due to humidity levels and other things, that when the snowflakes are coming down, even though the snowflakes are fairly next to each other, at the molecular level, there's radical differences there. Now, in some way, again, in some way, you might try to say that each person's brain is uniquely, or is similarly, a unique record of all of the environmental conditions that it has endured, and it's the condition of, of forming and reforming, and yet <clears throat> the problem is that new orders or new dynamics come in, that is, new forms of contragrade work. When I say contragrade work, I mean those capacities of work that are introduced from adjacent levels of orthograde process. So as you move, and this contragrade orthograde dynamic is occurring as you move from thermodynamic systems into morphodynamic systems into teleodynamic systems. And teleodynamic systems, those are one, and this is very controversial, where you have emergence of end directedness, where you have things like teleology. Now, it's not a teleology from on high. It's not some sort of religious notion of teleology. It has to do with emergent capacities of end-directedness that have been built in through constraint, or I will call them built in by what's been built out, and those constraints make possible various forms of uh, contragrade work. And try to think of the, let's see if I can maybe, I'll, I'll end with this example. I'm, I'm all over the place. It's an exceptionally difficult work. Uh, I can't recommend it enough, but try to think of the difference between daydreaming and actually thinking about something, right? When you're daydreaming about something, it seems like it's an orthograde process. It's as if thoughts just unfold and it's almost morphograde. It, I'm sorry, it's, it's a morphodynamic orthograde. That is, there's a kind of geometric tumbling of thoughts according to least resistance and of what connects with what in a convenient happenstance way. Uh, I think dreaming, dreaming itself also has this kind of orthograde morphodynamic process. But there's another kind of process, which is the conscious effort of directed thought, where you're you're trying to, in a willed way, when you feel your will, try to stop from daydreaming and, and get straight and go back to the thing that you were trying to think about. There, there's a contragrade process. And to see that although we do have mental phenomena that give illustration of something like agency, something like choice, this emerged out of orthograde phenomena at the level of teleodynamic process, which emerged out of contragrade and orthograde process at morphodynamic, which emerged out of the capacity to do work from the original state of tendency toward equilibrium that we're going to call the second law of thermodynamics. And so there is a sense in which life allows mind to emerge from matter, even though at no point it violates the second law of thermodynamics, but we have to rewrite what we mean by entropy in terms of orthograde and contragrade processes, in terms of different layers and dynamics that emerge, in particular the um, thermodynamic 
which is what I think we normally think of, and then the morphodynamic and then the teleodynamic. Uh, please get a copy of this book. Uh, let's talk about it. Thank you.